This is a pitch to ask you to join us at the American Schooner Association. Founded in 1972, the American Schooner Association is dedicated to the history, preservation, and promotion of the schooner rig. You don't need to be a schooner owner to join the organization, just to be interested in these beautiful boats. As time marches forward, the role that schooners played in the history of our country is fading too. Your membership helps support educational programs and provides a base for preserving these vessels. So join us. It's inexpensive, important, and we'd love to have you along. We'll see you at amschooner.net. Welcome, everybody. It's great to have you here tonight on this cool Wednesday in Annapolis, Maryland. We have a very interesting and fun guest with us tonight, my friend Will Soffern, who's written All Hands on Deck, a very, very interesting book. Uh, before we get going too far, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping here, a couple things going on. Uh, Will is going to show us a video and uh, then he'll talk during that video from time to time. If you have questions, we've got a question board running. So on your Zoom screens, just type something in the questions. And we also have a chat screen running. And what I would like very much is if you guys would take a moment just to type in where you're logging in from, and that'll help me figure out if it's working. So I'm gonna type in Annapolis, Maryland, And we hope it comes through. Oh, good. This looks great. Solomon's Atlantic County, County Irvine, Irvine County. That must be you. Look at that. From Quebec, of all places. Jay in Aruba. How about that? Isn't that crazy, Will? That is. How about that? <laughs> Limerick, Maine. There we go. Hey, how cool is that? Well, that's just wonderful. You know, I read that as Stuart flu, but anyway, I'd never get the idea. My wife has got the, got the flu right now. Anyway, guys, um, we're going to be talking to Will. If you have questions along the way, hold them until his presentation is finished, and then we'll dig in on it. It's, a, it's an amazing story, and I'm just really glad I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Will, say hi and talk to us a little bit. Hey, thanks for having me, Duncan. I uh, really appreciate the invite and this opportunity to talk to the members of the Schooner Association. I myself am a huge fan of schooners. I mean, who's not? Who's not? Um, <laughs> great boats, and uh, it's uh, it's just it's wonderful to see the reception that uh, the interest in my book and get to share everyone the story. I think what makes this presentation fun and unique is that while um, sailing the roads uh, to California to make the movie Master and Commander, three of us had video cameras on board. So tonight, during this presentation, I'm going to live narrate a uh, sort of a, a bit of a documentary I made. And uh, you're going to get to see a lot of stills, but then you're going to see some great film, actual film footage shot in the voyage. And then, um, and, you know, as you were saying, what I'm going to do is... Uh, turn off my camera while I do the presentation. Then at the end, I'll turn it back on and we'll work on rolling through uh, answering any questions that anybody has. And um, uh, hopefully uh, everybody enjoys tonight's presentation. Uh, I think that's a great way to do it. Um, I also will be turning off my camera to try and get the best feed we can. Our last session had a little, a few problems. So we're gonna try to avoid that by lessening the draw on the stream. Um, however, if any of you have anything you'd like to get across to the group while Will is running, just type in your chat box and we'll be ready to go. All right, Will, are you about ready? I'm ready to go. You Let's ready? Let's rock and roll, man. Let's make this mm -hmm. happen. 
Okay. Share that screen. All right. Okay, guys, I'm hanging on the sidelines. Tonight, I'm going to tell you all a story about a motley crew of sailors who did anything and everything it took to get the job done. See that guy in red up there? That's me doing the scariest thing I've ever done in my life, having to furl a square sail in the middle of a Porsche 12 storm, 60 feet above the deck. When I was 21 years old, I was hired to sail the American tall ship Rose from Newport, Rhode Island to San Diego to make the movie Master and Commander. And there's our ship over Russell Crowe's shoulder. We sailed 6,000 miles on this voyage. We departed from Newport and sailed south through the North Atlantic in January. Terrible time here to do that. We arrived in Puerto Rico. We then sailed from Puerto Rico through the Caribbean Sea to Panama, where we transited the Panama Canal. The voyage then continued north along the western seaboard until we arrived in San Diego. This is a profile diagram of Rose. She was 180 feet length overall, 136 feet on deck. She had a 30-foot beam, a 15-foot draft, displaced 500 tons of water, had 17 sails totaling 13,000 square feet of sail area, and the top of her main mast was 130 feet above her water. Fine. So, what's it take to sail a ship like Rose? Well, for starters, it takes a lot of muscle. The original Rose sailed with a crew of over 200 men. We did it with a crew of 30. Granted, we had modern amenities such as plumbing, electricity, and engines, but none of those perks helped us with trimming and setting the sails. We had to do that just as the crew did 200 years ago. And in order for us to do that, we needed great leadership. And that started with Captain Richard Bailey, who then hired our three officers, Tony, Andy, and Christina, who were followed up by our engineer, our bosun, our cook, and then finally, our deckhands, of which I was one. So how do I fit into this? I mean, I didn't grow up with a family of sailors, but I love Popeye, as you can see from this little <laughs> costume I'm wearing. Nice. Uh, after graduating from high school, I took a path less traveled, and I enrolled in an apprenticeship at the International Yacht Restoration School in Newport, Rhode Island, where I learned the fine art of how to restore and build wooden yachts. I loved it. It was incredible. But when I wasn't building boats, I was out sailing them. And that eventually led to me getting paid to fill in on the America's Cup 12 meter fleet in Newport. And once I knew that I could earn a living from sailing, I found my calling. 2001 marked the 150th anniversary of the race that became known as the America's Cup. And a giant event called the America's Cup Jubilee was organized. And I somehow landed a job on America's oldest 12-meter yacht, Ottawa, who had long since fallen from grace when Earl McMillan formed a syndicate to restore her to the event. We had one year to completely restore this yacht. It was intense. Nights, weekends, but we pulled it off and had her ready in time so that we could ship her over to Europe so she could race in England, Italy, Monaco, and France. When I was 21 years old, I was living on this boat in the French Riviera. My life was awesome. But <laughs> like all good things, the job came to an end when the season was over and I had to return back to Newport, homeless, broke, and without a job. Now, for Newport, for those that haven't been, was made famous as a summer Gilded Age retreat. Retreat. This is where Bob Dylan electrified folk for the first time and where Jay Leno hides out from paparazzi. In the summer, the streets swell with tourists. But come winter, Newport becomes a barren wasteland. And me being 21 years old and totally full of myself, I thought I'd come back and there'd be some yacht waiting for me with a mate's position ready to sail down to the Caribbean. But the truth was, there were no jobs. All the spots were filled, the boats were gone, and so Casey, the captain of Ottawa, sent me down to Rose to beg for work. So how did Rose come to be? Well, in 1969, historian John Millar, only 24 years old at the time, commissioned acclaimed shipbuilding yard Smith & Rowland of Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, to build a replica of the 1757 HMS Rose for the American Bicentennial Celebration. Rose was built for a mere $300,000. That's equivalent to $2.5 million today. 
despite the skepticism, Malar pulls it off and she's delivered in time for the event. Here we see her dock in Newport's downtown waterfront for the bicentennial celebration. And here we see her on a period postcard. But then what happens after the event? I mean, there's no plan for the ship. And nearly a decade goes by as she falls into a terrible state of disrepair and decay until Connecticut businessman Kay Williams purchases the ship. Now, Williams is the owner of the family-owned and operated Captain's Cove Seaport located in Black Rock Harbor, Connecticut. Williams tows the ship down to his marina. And he begins a massive rebuild with Captain Richard Bailey. And they rebuild the ship while she's floating in the water from the waterline up. The project is immense, and it becomes a community effort. But eventually, William's goal is achieved when the United States Coast Guard certifies Rose as America's only Class A sailing school vessel. Rose then goes on serve as a sail training platform offering various sail training opportunities to the public until she was acquired by 20th Century Fox to make Master and Commander. So, okay, now that you got the backstory, let's take you back to 2001. Rose was the antithesis of all my career ambitions. I wanted nothing to do with her, but I didn't have a choice. <laughs> now, Casey told me to ask for a man named Tony, and I had visions of a guy with a beard and tattoos and a raspy voice, someone who looks like that, right? Instead, I get introduced to a young Tom Cruise lookalike who's oddly cool and normal. And after talking to me for a few minutes, Tony invites me down into the ship. And he's talking to me, asking questions, and we walk onto the gun deck, which is sort of like the living room. It's where the crew laments about how hard life is on board and we're walking up forward up to the bow and he opens up this tiny little hatch and he brings me down to this tiny little compartment where you can't even stand it. This is where it happens. This is where he offers me the job. 25 cents an hour and all the salt water I can drink, I can sail to Hollywood to make a movie. That's great. <laughs> Tom Rothman is one of the most accomplished men in Hollywood. At the time, he was co-chairman of 20th Century Fox. Today, he's the chairman and CEO of Sony Motion Picture Group. Rothman is responsible for movies like Much Ado About Nothing, Titanic, Avatar. And guess what? He loves Patrick O'Brien book. So who's Patrick O'Brien? Well, for starters, he's an Irish author who pretended to be he was English. I don't know. He's best known for his 20-book Aubrey Matron series framed around the relationships of Captain Jack Aubrey and Stephen Matron during the Napoleonic Wars. Well, Rothman read all the books, loved them, bought the rights to make a movie, and spent nearly 10 years trying to figure out how he was going to do it. That's where acclaimed film director Peter Weir comes in, who in the last couple of years won an honorary Oscar for his work on movies such as Witness, Dead Poet Society, and The Truman Show. Well, Rothman pitches Weir the job three times before he finally says yes. But with an agreement in place, Weir sent off to go find the starship of his movie. And he went to the 2000 Tall Ship Festival in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, where he found Rose, the very ship that O'Brien said was much like the surprise that he wrote about in his novel, as depicted in this painting by marine artist Jeff Hunt. With the ship secured, Weir got to work writing the script. Well, I accept the job and move on board the first week of November. And to say the least, the living accommodations are atrocious. But fortunately, I was able to persuade my best friend, Jared, to take the job with me because I was honestly too chicken to take it alone. A few days move after moving onto the ship, we motor rose over to Newport Shipyard to begin a massive refit to prepare her for the voyage. First item on the list is repowering the ship. And that meant getting these old engines up out of the engine room. In order to do that, we set a guy, uh, this I-beam on our gun deck and we set up chain lifts so we could lift the engine up onto dolly. The engines were then slid forward so that a crane could hoist them out of our cargo hatch. Days later, our new Caterpillar 3406 diesel engines arrive. And they in turn are craned down into the ship and lowered into our engine room so they can be mounted and set in place. Now, I'm the ship's carpenter, so while all that engine work is going on, 
I'm tasked with rebuilding the mass partners at the four mass. Now, as many of you know, the mass partner is that structural element that prevents the mass from wobbling the deck to pieces. Days later, Rose is towed over to the railway so she can be hauled out and we can begin the long list of underbody work that needs to happen. Soon, scaffolding's built around the ship, chainsaws are broken out, mallets, noises everywhere, our work list is growing. But fortunately, the officers have been aggressively recruiting crew members some for the good, some for the bad. I mean, we become this melting pot of personalities. And I'm not trying to pick on anyone. If my wife was here, she'd tell you that my personality is a bit of an acquired taste. But we are all there for a job. And we have to learn how to put our differences aside because we're not just working. We're living together. We're doing everything together. Now, mind you, it wasn't all terrible on Rose. I mean, it was hard, but we still had a lot of good moments and good laughs together, See, I mean, here's Captain Bailey washing his dog, Jackal, in the galley sink. And here's our Christmas tree lashed to the ship's wheel. But after two months of hard work, we can see the fruition of our labor coming to be. Rose is ready to be put back in the water. Soon she floats. Now, to reward us for all of our hard work, the officers throw a costume-themed farewell party and provide copious amounts of rum. And we all know what happens sailors and rum get together, right? We had a great time, but still lingering in the back of our minds was, when were we going to get underway? There was no good weather window, and the production company was putting a lot of pressure on Captain Bailey to get the ship to California. We depart for Newport on a cold, blustery January afternoon. Oh, I don't miss days like that. There I am with Jared saying my final farewell with the Newport Bridge in the background. Now the crew was broken up into three watches. Each watch was led by an officer, followed by an able-bodied seaman, and then six deckhands. Those not on watch were Captain Bailey and his dog Jackal, our engineer, our boss, and our cook, and the Hollywood representatives sent to safeguard their investment. Not wanting to miss a beat, the officers hop right into conducting safety drills so we can operate the vessel safely through the evening. The next morning, hands are sent aloft as we ready to set the square sails for the first time on our voyage. Fortunately, all that time together in the yard had conditioned us how to work together as a team. Within a few minutes, I understand all that's great about sailing a ship like Rose. So this being uh, relatively calm compared to earlier today, shortly after we sent all this canvas, this is actually the first time I've been able to kind of comfortably take the camera out on deck. I am overcome with excitement. I understand the magic of what it means to sail on a ship like Rose. And look at that sunset. The next day, we cross the Gulf Stream. We're through the worst of it. We shred our winter gear. And we bask in the warm and tranquil North Atlantic yeah. Ocean. Thoughts on today? Beautiful day. Oh, how naive we all were. I read the book. Beaufort wind scale is an empirical measure that relates wind speed to observed conditions at sea and on land. It ranges from forces 0 through 12, 12 being classified as 64 plus knots or hurricane conditions. This is a wind barb chart showing a universal representation of wind speed and direction. Now you'll notice that I've highlighted the 75 knot barb. This is a NOAA weather chart from January 13th, 2002. You'll see where I've highlighted that barb exactly where our ship is. This is what hurricane conditions look like on a ship like Rose. All right, now you see that guy in red right there? That's me again. Having just inspected our four feet, we were taking on so much water. Our pumps were constantly running. Now, I was having a great time, completely ignorant of the dangers of the situation. But I can't say everybody on board was having a great time. In this shot, you're going to see Rose do a 60 degree roll. And 
I know we've all got sailors here, right? Everyone knows how beautiful and graceful sailing is. It's loud actually below, right? I mean, for us, our ship was getting wrapped and it was deafening, the creaking, the crushing, the noises that were coming out of her. Here we've got Scott explaining to the camera why the lights are out behind him. We had so much water coming in, the electrical fires started to pop up, so we had to kill a lot of the electricity in the ship. At this point, we're being told to hydrate and put on sunscreen. I mean, that's never a good sign. Here we are, we're back up on deck. These have built to 30 feet. Where we're standing, where the camera footage is being taken, is 20 feet above the ship's water line. Now, sailing a ship like Rose in conditions like this, it's tough. It's not yachting. There's no bimini, there's no autopilot. You just gotta kind of be out there and take it like a man, right? And steering this ship was difficult. We had two helmsmen on the wheel at all times. Sometimes a third had to even jump in. Here in this shot, you can see Captain Bailey wedged in the port quarter. Now watch that horizon in the background. Look how much rolling we're doing. But as the day goes on, we acclimate, we have fun, we tell jokes, we're cracking up again. Watch the horizon background, the amount of pitching that our ship is doing. So John's just explained to the camera that one of our square sails has come unfurled and Tony chooses me to go aloft with him. Now I don't get it, there's 30 of us on board and I am not one of the more experienced sailors. Now getting up there, that was not so easy. I mean, we're free climbing 60 feet up and shimming out to the end of the yard arm. And that's when Tony tells me the plan. We are going to jump on the sail and punch it as hard as we can. That's his plan. Yeah. Now. Unfortunately, you're not gonna to get to see the rodeo show here because John uh, had a bag over his camera and he took the bag off the camera. And while he did that, you kind of missed that action shot right there. Here we've got the sail under control. And what we're doing is we're wrapping sail gaskets around it to make sure it doesn't come unfurled again and nobody has to go along. Now with the sail secured, Tony tells me to head back to deck. And I gotta tell you, he didn't have to tell me twice. Now, ascending the rig, not that bad. I'm holding on tight and I'm climbing up, looking forward. But when I had to descend the rig, I'm looking down and I'm watching our ship bury its bow into the troughs of the waves and the whole rig would shake and I'd hold on and not fall off. I was exhausted by the time I got back to deck. But, not Tony, I mean, he is some kind of like superhuman. I mean, look at this guy. It's like taking a stroll through a park or something. I would follow Tony to hell back any day. Now, we make it through this storm, but I can't say that's the same for everyone. This is Rose's sister ship Bounty when she sank in Hurricane Sandy. Of her 15 member crew, one died and her captain was lost at sea. And this photo was taken within a hundred miles of the footage I just showed. Well, it's hard to believe that we were in such a dire situation 24 hours prior, let alone know that that flag was five days new, three wow. days prior. The interior of our ship is destroyed. It looks worse than my daughter's bedroom on a Saturday morning and all of our toilet paper has been soaked. But after conducting sail repairs for a few hours, we hoist and set all of our square sails again and continue to charge south to our first port of call, Puerto Rico. Now, I'll tell you what, before that storm, this would have seemed like a great amount of breeze, but now it feels like it's just enough to get us there. Land ho, we sight land. Hands are sent aloft as we ready to furl the square sails and dock our ship. Now, after having nearly looked death in the eyes, out in the ocean, I was chomping at the bits for fun. I couldn't wait to explore Puerto Rico, have some drinks, meet the women. And then reality set in when I realized where we were docking roads, which is looked like some, you know, half, a, half abandoned terminal that, from the film Mad Max. 
Then adding insult to injury, the officers told us about a massive work list that needed to happen. See, what happened was during the storm, this bit in yellow, our upright bit, uh, fractured, causing the bowsprit to push into the ship. And what that did was it compromised the integrity of our rig. We needed to slack the rigging, push the bowsprit out, temporarily shore that upright bit, then reset the bowsprit and retune all the rigging all in just two days' time. Those not working on the bowsprit repair were sent aloft to rig up our tagallants, the highest square sails, for our next leg. Now, the officers told us that we would get a half day off in Puerto Rico. Not wanting to miss a second, we all pitched in and rented a minivan and went looking for a beach. And guess what? After sailing to Puerto Rico, we got lost trying to find the beach. Here we are asking a local for directions. But eventually we find the famed Rincon. And we get to enjoy a few hour reprieve from the oppressive conditions on the tall ship Rose. We are now a conditioned crew. I mean, when we departed from Newport, I didn't know what any line really did on our ship. I had never sailed roads, but now I get it. I understand how it works. It makes sense to me. And that means that I can sit back and relax and enjoy the sail. As any good sailor here knows, that's when horrible things happen. It was about an hour before sunset and I'm standing in line waiting for dinner when I hear a giant explosion and the ship shake. And all of a sudden I hear a call for all hands on deck and I come running up and I see the last thing any sailor ever wants to see. We had been dismasted under full sail in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. So, what happened exactly? This is a diagram of Rose's rig where you can see all of her masts up, right? Now what happened was our main to gallant mast exploded, falling forward, calling our main, causing our main mast uh, topmast to also suffer a structural failure. This caused our four to gallant yard to snap in half. Now here you can see a diagram showing what we're left with as far as what's stable and what's not. The problem was we were worried about striking the rest of the sail because if we struck the rest of the sail, maybe the entire rig would go over. Now I'm up on deck for maybe two seconds and yeah, Tony taps me on the shoulder and tells me to go aloft on the main mast with Andy and Christina, our second and third mates. There I am up at the top of the main mast trying to figure out which side I'm going to jump to when this whole thing does fall over. Here we're looking up now at the foremast and you can see Tony and our bosun working on the four to gallon yard trying to figure out how they're going to sort that right now. Captain Bailey takes the wheel. It's the only time he steered the ship in the entire voyage. Here we see hands on deck ready to lend a hand waiting for us to shout down orders. This is a shot from my perspective, looking down, and you can see the broken mat over the front of our top topsail. Here you see a silhouette of Tony cutting away the four to gallon sail in the sunset. We work into the evening and through the night. Unfortunately, our officers are incredible leaders and they keep everyone oh, calm. Good luck, babe. They tell jokes and everyone gets a chance to pitch in and work a lot. The next morning, we begin lowering the broken elements of our rig to deck. We are tired and exhausted, but we carry on. Days later, we arrive in Cologne, Panama, the Atlantic port entrance city to the Panama Canal. Now, fortunately, the owner of our ship has a very big wallet, and that meant that we were going to be able to hire a crane to help us with the continued downrigging of the broken elements of our rig. Now, working in Panama had to be one of the worst experiences of my life. It was so hot. The heat index was over 120 degrees. Mind you, we've been working nonstop, and there's a lot of grumbling on board. The crew is getting upset. There's no break for us. The officers are just pushing us and pushing us. I mean, here we see some smiles at the end of the day, but I don't know. That seems like a fake one if I've ever seen. Now, since departing for Newport, we'd only been given a half day off in, Pan in Puerto Rico. In Panama, we were given three hours. And I'll tell you what, after that first hour, I was ready to leave. Now, the Panama Canal, for those that don't know, is an artificial waterway that's 51 miles long 
that connects the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific, located at the Isthmus of Panama. Fortunately, we were granted an evening slot to go through the canal, a welcome reprieve from the sun and the heat. Now, going through the Panama Canal means transiting three ascending locks that raise your vessel up to the height of the man-made lake in the center of the canal. You then transit that lake, and on the other end of the canal, you go through three descending locks that lower you to Pacific height level. The entire process took us about seven and a half hours. Once in the Pacific, we motored out to the Panamanian island of Taboga. The next morning, I wake up in absolute paradise. It's beautiful and to reward us for all the hard work, the officers announced that we've all earned a half day off. Lucky us, right? Now, after me getting to stand uh, first watch, I get to hop in a dinghy and head to shore to have fun for the rest of the day. And unlike most of my shipmates who hung out on the beach, I decided to go hike up to the top of the island and check out some views. But eventually, we all rendezvous at the same hotel that has a pool and very cheap pina coladas. The next morning, we depart for Mexico. Captain Bailey puts two hands on our dinghy with our cameras so we can show you this incredible footage of our dismasted frigate under sail. I'm pretty sure this is the only genuine footage of a dismasted frigate under sail in existence in the world. Now, back to work, right? There's that famous saying, uh, idle hands at the devil's workshop, and boy, the officers really wanted to put us to work to keep us busy. And boy, did they. I mean, here they've got us scraping the broken spars that are laying on deck. We were toweling the rig and just coming up with everything they could get us to do. And the crew emotions are getting angry. People are getting tired of being worked so hard. I mean, you can see the anger here and frustration from the crew members, but it wasn't just us that the officers had to deal with. There was also the same Tawanapec winds, which was like a microburst, almost a hurricane force wind that comes down through Shiva's path. And then we had the actual threat of pirates. Here we've got the Mexican Navy coming to offer us assistance. We armed our cannons with our nails and screws. And I mean, just going through that mechanic was quite, quite hysterical. But fortunately, we arrived in Acapulco mostly unscathed. Ship, very little is broken. But crew morale has been crushed. And so the officers know that they've got to cut us a slack. And they announced that we are going to get a full 24 hours off from the ship. And you can see what that does for morale. With our ship dock, we take on the best that Acapulco has to offer, starting with mechanical bull riding. We then go see the famed Acapulco cliff divers. My personal favorite was bombing around downtown Acapulco in the old-fashioned Volkswagen Beetle taxi. Our youngest crew member, only 16, tried bungee jumping for the first time. His mom just saw this footage this summer for her first time, and she was not too happy. But I'll tell you what, this is where it all finally came together for us. All that anger that we were feeling, the resentment, sort of seemed to melt away. Everyone put their differences aside, and we all started to get along. Our voyage continues on for 2,000 more miles, and you think Mother Nature would stop, right? I mean... We've been through a lot, but no, here's a water spout. And I'll tell you what, here's three water spouts in a row. And Rose continues to deteriorate as we make our way north through the pounding head seas. Here we've got her bow rails crumbling, being lashed on. But it's not all terrible. I mean, we see dolphins. We make time to read books. I even had time to build a fake fish and play a prank on Captain Bailey. But eventually, we arrive in San Diego. And like the day we departed at Newport, it's cold and gray. Now, the morale and sentiment on the ship is mixed. Some of the crew members are happy for having accomplished our mission, while others are sad because the rare chemistry that we form together will forever fall apart and not exist. And at this point, Rose is too broken to sail. Collaboration is the process of two or more people working together to complete a task or achieve a goal. I ask you, how did our officers pull this off? How did they get this motley crew of misfits to cooperate and work together? I mean, we sailed through some pretty fierce weather. And we survived a dismasting under full sail without anyone being killed or horribly injured. We slept while others stood watch. And we learned through the process of doing. 
beginning, we were all just colleagues, but we became so much more. We became a family. When I think about it, I can come up with three words that define the success of our office. The first start word is leadership. The next word is mentorship. And the most important word is friendship. Now, Rose really was too broken to sail. So broken that the insurance companies mandated that we haul her out in San Diego, create, complete a long list of structural repairs before she could go to Mexico for filming. So we began her aesthetic transformation to surprise in San Diego. Once we got the green light, we put her back in the water and brought her down to Ensenada, where we completed her aesthetic transformation to HMS Surprise so she could star in the feature film, Mastering Commander. Turret flags! When we board, you'll take him out of the ship. Take him out of the ship. Thank you, sir. For home and for the prize. Hello! Stay off to us. Let's fly. All right, that's uh, that concludes my presentation. My goodness gracious me, <laughs> that was really wonderful, <laughs> really wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Oh my god! Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to take a look at any questions you might have, and we will take a look at that, and also take a look down your chats. Uh, will, that was just terrific. Obviously, you've done this before. <laughs> Will tells me his book um, is selling very well, and I'm awfully glad to hear it. How uh, long was the trip? Okay, well, let's say the uh, thank you, thank you for the comment of the superb show. Uh, the trip was 36 days. 36 days, man. And you can keep that uh, that North Atlantic business. Um, did uh, Johnny Hines is asking? Uh, did your officers have any previous leadership experience? Uh, yes, they did. Um, you know, tall ship training is 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 a sort of a, a, a business that's been working for quite a long time right now. And so I'd say that half of the crew members, we had, we had 30 crew members, all were hired for this mission. And half of them had a substantial amount of tall ship sailing experience. Our officers were extremely qualified sailors and great instructors and mentors. Nice, nice, nice. Somebody's asking if you're still in touch with your crew members. Uh, yes, I am still in touch with uh, not all my crew members. For the book, I was able to get uh, reach out to successfully 22 of the 30. Um, you know, I, I'd be lying if I said that we all got along and we didn't. So that's where a few uh, were not interested in participating with the research for the book, uh, unfortunately. And I, I feel bad for them because, uh, you know, we didn't have an opportunity to have closure. But I think uh, even the individuals that I, you know, didn't get along with them. I, I really appreciate them because it took all of us to achieve what we did. And, and, and I talk about it in the book too, where I say that um, in the times that it really mattered, those differences were non-existent. We yeah. were all working together as a team. Um, and also there were just a few people who just didn't want to be found that couldn't be found. I tried really hard, but uh, I did my best. Well, that, that just compliments your personality. Nat Let's Benjamin, see. Um, you your name, you, Nat Benjamin, you had your hand up, and I accidentally tapped it down. So if you would do that again, we'll follow up on you. What do you got there, Will? Um, let's see. I see. A, when did we make the trip? The trip was made in 2002. We departed in January uh, of 2002. Pretty nice. Um, let's see. I'm also seeing in the comments. We've got some questions. Uh, I'm going to try and go through. Um Let's see, great presentation. Are you still, are you saying the HMS Surprise in the San Diego Maritime Museum is Rose? Yes. The Rose presently is the uh, surprise as part of the San Diego Maritime Museum. She gets a lot of flack right now because she is in rough shape. And I, I really uh, try to defend the museum on that note. First off, the San Diego Maritime Museum, an incredible museum. It's a floating museum. They don't own a single building. Wow. Um, and Crazy. it is compl really completely 
run by volunteers. There is a very small staff, but Ray Ashley has really put together a great program. I mean, I've gone and sailed on the Californian, which is the California state flagship, a beautiful, beautiful vessel to go sailing yeah, on. It's and it's amazing. And, a, and a, it's all sailed by volunteers. It's really an amazing experience. Unfortunately, uh, the surprise, the priority of the production company was to make a perfect prop for a movie. And that didn't mean doing the right work that was in the best interest of the vessel. So the Maritime Museum uh, found themselves in possession of a ship that already was an aging vessel that needed a lot of work and then uh, had a lot of work under her that was not um, not good for the longevity. So I think um, she is in rough shape, but it's, uh, I think it'd be very, I think the museum does a good job with the cards they've been dealt. Yeah, you got that there. Was the ship equipped with Jarvis Brace winches? You might talk about the winches or lack thereof. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say there there were no winches on, uh, on Rose whatsoever. Uh, we did have a capstan, but uh, no winches. You know, I, I enjoyed reading about uh, you guys working the capstan, which just talk a little bit about bringing the anchor up. It's a terrible. Yeah. Story. Oh, God. Yeah, I, I, I did not enjoy that at all. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, weighing anchor on a, on a ship like this is really hard. And I'll tell you, what, I, I whine about it in the book quite a bit because you have to. You do. Uh, you, you set up the chain. And what happens is you 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 wind uh, a, a cable. Uh, around the capstan, which is a, a manually operated winch where you've got all these human bodies pushing its turn. And then what happens is you're able to pull the chain all the way back to a certain point. And then you got to stop, strap it off, reset the whole mechanism, do it again, pull all the chain up. You're pulling the weight of the vessel forward through the water as you're doing this. And, you know, I, I complain a lot about this, but this year, I'm really, my book tour really uh, took me a lot of places. I went over to Europe and I got to go see Victory in England, Very which was, cool. yeah, yeah, which is, you know, the, Rose was a sixth rate frigate, which is the smallest class frigate that could be commanded by um, a, uh, a captain. Uh, and whereas uh, you get to victory and she's a first rate and she's the ship that uh, Lord Nelson was killed on ultimately. Oh, uh, but boy, <laughs> that ship, oh, I, I would not want to imagine trying to weigh anchor on that ship. I can believe it. Here's one. How much of the movie scenes were actually shot on the boat? Ooh, very few movie scenes were actually shot on the boat. As uh, many people might know, we built a full scale replica of the ship in the tank that they shot Titanic in. And the real uh, ship was used for the distance shot. So there's about 15 days of filming done on the real ship. But if you see any distance shots, that's the actual ship. Right. Everything else was done in the tank or through CGI. It, it's It's amazing to watch. Yeah, during that uh, trip through the North Atlantic, you say something in your book which really terrifies me. You've got a lot of water coming in the bow, and all of a sudden, she goes up, and you can see light between the boards. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty terrifying. I'm sure anybody here who's got a winter boat knows that if, you, if you're on a boat and you, um, you have to see light through the planking seams underwater, that's a pretty terrifying feeling right yeah. there. Especially, uh, I'll say, when you're in the middle of the ocean. And there's nowhere to go uh, except down. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> oh God, uh, really good. Um, let's see. We got a bunch of questions. Let's keep work helping answer these questions. Um, did any of the delivery crew work on uh, the movie? Yes, a good portion of the delivery crew did work on the movie. There was a good turnover, say, so maybe fifty percent of the crew stayed on for the filming of the movie. Uh, funny little fact I like to talk about is uh, Peter Weir wanted. Um, everyone on the crew to look very weird for the film, very unique. And <laughs> what looks really odd is when you put beards on women. So <laughs> I've I've seen a few more of the female crew members. No, uh, you didn't do that. The, Did you really? The, yeah, that really happened. Yeah. Um, but I would like to say too, I'd like to use this opportunity where, for me, I think one thing that makes this story really special and important is there's a lot of stories about men sailing and doing something or even like all women's teams, but there's really no stories about men and women working and sailing together in a situation like this. And I, I think um, it's important to recognize the, the decency that was required and 
I think also the forward thinking, I think our ship was very fair and equal. I mean, we had, uh, you know, the two officers who were male and one was a female. Uh, my two uh, senior uh, ABs on my watch were women. And I really um, I cherished working with these women. And it really influenced me uh, as a maritime professional going forward, where I put up very high priority hiring women over men often. Um, because yeah. I just felt that women were wonderful to work with. Well, in, you know, in reality, it makes us all behave better. And yeah. uh, that's the way it ought to be. That's the way it ought to be. You know, I've been thinking about this experience you've had and the age you were, you were in your 20s at the time. And uh, just what a formative experience it is, you know, having a chance to travel with people. And so few of our young people get a chance to do that anymore. And I know you're writing a new book that has to do with apprenticeship. And a lot of that is a continuation of the theme of working with someone learning from a mentor and that sort of thing. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons I, the, the reason why I wrote this book was I have a daughter who's eight years old and I did an apprenticeship to become a wooden boat builder. And today my career, I live in, uh, in Santa Barbara, California, and I have an architectural design business. Um, my wife is a pediatrician and she did the opposite of me. She had to go all the way through school and I have been able to create a career without uh, a formal academic education. And I believe that continued education is imperative, but I just hope that when my daughter is a teenager, that she'll read a story like this and feel more confident about making the right decision for her and what she wants to do in life. Again, I, I feel that continuing to learn is imperative, but I don't think there's one solution for everyone yeah. and i think it's important that we let younger people know that there's a lot of ways that we can be successful and happy yeah. in and that's a theme that's going to run through your new book so that's going to be pretty cool um i do still uh mary i see your comment um yes i'm still sailing i've got a boat in marina del rey uh which is uh in los angeles and one of the crew members on this book uh in the story his name is mandrew he was the 16 year old time uh when I started writing this book, I reached back out to as many people as I could, and we ended up reconnecting. And Mandrew has actually become sort of the brother that I never had. He is a member of my family, and we bought a boat together during the pandemic. Oh, my God. And uh, um, But this year, um, I'm planning on doing the Newport Bermuda race, and I've also been invited out on the Coast Guard Eagle to do some sailing. So Very, very fun. Very fun. Looks like we have a little uh, comment from uh, my friend Nat Benjamin up in Martha's Vineyard, and he hopes to see you on the vineyard this summer. Says I hope I hope to see Nat on the vineyard this summer as well. I love Nat. Um, yeah, great, great guy. He gave us a wonderful presentation about his trip to Haiti, of all things. So, my goodness. Nat was uh, a, such a kind host of me uh, last summer, and I really, really... Uh, appreciate it and uh it's just uh, great to spend some time there with him and boy gannon benjamin if anyone has not been to gannon benjamin please go out of your way to sail and see one of the most beautiful shops that you'll ever experience anywhere in the world i will i will second that i his his hospitality was wonderful when i was there here's an interesting comment there is honor and manual labor it is, however, important to be open-minded. Now, I think that's pretty pretty right on. You know, when we're all working on something together, <laughs> somebody messes up, it's a problem. What else we got there? Uh, uh, let's see. Let's see. We got a question from Greg. Did you sing any sea shanties during your trip? No, <laughs> I did not. I will no say way. that there were some tall ship sailors there who very much love their sea shanties, but... Captain Bailey uh, 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 sort of has a nickname that he carries with him called the Anti Shanty Captain, and uh, <laughs> he was not shanties were not welcomed by Captain Bailey. But you know, some people still got them on the side. But I, I, I I'm not much of a sea shanty person myself. But uh, but they're fun. They certainly are fun. Oh, nice. Um, let's see. Um, question is, I read your book. This is uh, from Jennifer. Mm -hmm. I read your book and really appreciate it. Also went to Newport for the first time and enjoyed it too. 
Will you go in the rose again? That's a that's a really good question. People ask me, is uh, I get that asked quite a bit. Would I do this again? And I'd say, uh, knowing what I know now, oh, no. <laughs> I would not do this. But um, but but that's the beautiful thing of life. I mean, you nobody knows what's really going to happen out there. Um, I think it is so important to go out and make adventures in this world, and I hope that. Uh, you know, everyone here will, you know, tell their stories to try and inspire other people to make their adventures. And, you know, I think um, uh, as hard and as brutal as this was, it was one of the most transformative experiences I've had in my life. Yeah. And I, I really understand that. What else? Um, let's see. Any chance the Rose will be used as a training ship? I don't think there's any chance Rose will be used as a training ship. Um, I think that uh, she's sort of just going to be a beautiful. Yeah, um, you know, it, it's interesting. You showed that terrible picture of Bounty going down. And when I ran uh, National Maritime Heritage Foundation in D.C., Bounty came to visit. And Bounty was built as a movie prop. And it was in pretty rough shape when it was down there. And I would not want to take it out there. So there you go. And then uh, Roger Phillips, the name of the book is All Hands on Deck. A modern day high seas adventure to the far side of the world. Yep. And uh, last I looked, you had a picture of that uh, <laughs> somewhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Are there any other questions anybody has? Or great, good. Well, let's see. I, I got a couple a couple things to, to ask you myself. Did you, it, according to what you showed us? Did you actually have any practice setting sail before you guys actually left Newport? Uh, no. I mean, there may have been some practice, but uh, at my role as a ship's carpenter really put me in a unique position because I was very valuable labor. So Captain Bailey, for all of our time in Newport in preparation, really commandeered me and had me doing different work than the rest of my peers were doing. Um, so there were times where I'll say uh, uh, as, as we were um, bending the sails onto the yards, that was maybe a little bit of sailing sort of prep experience for everyone. But again, yeah. you, you look at what tall ship training is and the rows operated for some time before this, taking out new trainees who had never sail, set a square sail on right, the ship before right. yeah. and taught them how to do it. So I think... Um, yeah. I felt safe the entire time with everyone on board. Um, I think there was great leadership and good experience. And you know, I, I think that's really a, a real uh, compliment to the leadership itself. There, you know, there are times you can have somebody on board and you see water squashing around and you go, oh, my God. Looked at one of the pictures I saw at the beginning. Looks like you had uh, another ship behind you named Mystic Whaler once upon a time. And one, one of your opening shots. Could be. So I think our friend John Edgerton may be watching. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was uh, a shot I had of Captain Bailey where he was, uh, yeah. I think he was on a different vessel. But yeah, there's the whaler there. Now the whaler is based in Oxnard, California. Yep. And uh, my friend John Edgerton is a happy camper retired over in uh, Chestertown, of all things. Uh, um, I, I see a question that popped up. Was the dismasting a result of overcarrying sail or was it faulty mass condition or faulty rigging. So the dismasting was, I think, a combination of effects. Um, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and I talk about it in the book where there is uh, in our logbook an entry of a rogue wave. And now a rogue wave is not, and I'm going to give you all the factors to it. A rogue wave is not necessarily a giant wave. It's a wave that's not part of the wave pattern. Yeah, and so. We have a wave, we have um, a lot of canvas up. And what happened was, I think we had a helmsman who was not so good at being a helmsman. And when that wave hits the bow, and we've got all that pressure in that canvas, and a helmsman who's not ready to, to you know, counter that wave and just sort of uh, adjust the helm in advance, uh, that, that helped the ship round up. And then what we learned later on was that there were some scarfs that had been made in one of the masts earlier in the, the mast life. Now the, the masts were 
still in good shape, but the question of maybe these scarfs were not uh, holding up their integrity. Yeah. And then there's also the probability that we had such a rapid turnaround in Puerto Rico for the um, for the de- tuning the rig because of that bowsprit repair. So you kind of add all that together. And you could say maybe it's sort of a little perfect storm there. Yeah, and you probably had a lot of torque going on there while you were twisting up and being pushed around, too. Absolutely. Oh, here's a nice one. This kind of leads me into uh, having you talk a little bit about the routine during your watch. You had to do boat check. And the question was, what did you do when you could see daylight through the planks? (laughs) Um, There really wasn't much you could do when you saw daylight through the planks. we had the pumps going as hard as I could. Um, I was specifically up in the four peak when I saw the daylight coming through the planks to make sure the pumps were working. We needed to make sure that um, there were no clogs, nothing was blocking the lines. One of our able body seamen uh, stayed down below the entire time. We did, we did rebuild the bilge pump manifold system before departing from Newport. And I know that his name's Aaron Singh. He's the director of the New York Harbor School. Yeah. Great sailor. And Aaron um, Aaron spent the entire storm making sure that all of our strainers were clean. And I think, um, you know, that that really was a key element. Uh, Going back to the bounty, if, if anyone has read uh, Michael Tugues' book, uh, Rescue of the Bounty, um, really what it came down to, I think, in the Coast Guard report was that there was not enough uh, pump service on the ship. Yeah. And that's essentially what overwhelmed the vessel. Well, when more comes in than you could push out, you got a problem. Yeah. It's just a fact. Well, Will, we're coming up to the end of our time here, and I really, really want to thank you for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Does anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask before we hang up here? Back to the dismasting. Here we go. You got that? Um. Back to dismasting, I'm curious if the 40-gallon braces are run through the main mast, and if yes, how did you manage to control the four stack? So the um, so the 40-gallon braces were run back to the main mast, not through the mast. Um, and so when we had the dismasting, um, the 40-gallon, that caused the 40-gallon yard to snap in half as well. So, um, so we had that issue up there, but the four to gallon uh, uh, the ears, those were um, braced back to a lower section on the main mast. So we still had control of what would be the um, the main to- the four tops I mean. And of course, there's a wonderful, wonderful last question. What's your next book? Okay, next book is uh, about. Uh, got a working title, so I'm not going to announce it, but it's about the uh, state of apprenticeship in America. What I'm doing is I am uh, interviewing people all around the country who have built uh, incredible careers, I think, through hard work and perseverance and have learned how to master their trade or or their vocation, I'd like to say, because, uh, you know, not everything associated with apprenticeships needs to be a trade, but there's nothing negative about trade, but I think there's been a negative connotation with yeah. the word trade. But um, I t- I'm planning on shedding some light on uh, how apprenticeship is thriving in America and making a major comeback and uh, proves to be an incredible um, uh, opportunity for future generations of students. And, and you know, that's support. a perfect theme for what you learned on the, tr- on the ship. And I think it's a wonderful segue. All right, my friends. This uh, interview will be available up on our website, and uh, I hope you get a chance to visit. Also, I will give one more plug to join the American Schooner Association at amschooner.net. We would love to have you. And you should see this up on the website, I would say, within about 24 to 48 hours, depending just how busy I am tomorrow. (laughs) So there you go. Will, you've done a wonderful job. Thank you. All the best to you all. Thank you all for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. Have a nice night. Thank you, everyone. You betcha. Thanks, Duncan. Oh, my pleasure entirely.